But before we, but we think opposition also has a burden to prove. We have to show you that again, on the comparative, a multi-party system is more effective. But before we get into this debate, let's model out a few key terms so it runs pretty clearly. We think a two-party system is somewhat like a Republican uh, Democrat system like we have in the United States, right? We think this is fundamentally a principle debate. We don't have to prove to you that there are like practical errors within the state system. We just have to prove that in the case when you have a two-party house with Democrats and Republicans, we think that's the system we're gonna argue for. We think a multi-party system is something like in the UK or in India where you have more than one party, you actually have lots and lots of different parties, as many as you need. And we think more effective means that it's more efficient and that there's better representation we think that's what more efficient governments are going to be in this debate. This house is going to be democracies in general. Oh, right, so with that clear, let's move on to this first point about representation and social cohesion. What we tell you here, ladies and gentlemen, is that governments foster better policies that are more inclusive and create better social cohesion towards a more progressive society under a bipartisan system. So first, let's ask this question, why do democracies exist in the status quo? We think democracies exist to fundamentally represent the people, right? That's the goal of a democracy. But beyond that, not at this time, we tell you democracies also exist to create social cohesion, right? We think that we're not representing every single person's views, but we kind of take into accept and serve the fact that we need to have some kind of collective no thank you that progresses towards a better society and a more effective government, right? So we think it's insofar as we establish both of these, that democracies represent people and that that Pop, and that that government can progress. We think that's a better government. So what happens then under a two-party political system? We think these two parties need all of the votes they can get, right? They need all of the voter population, all the different types of demographics to subscribe to their agendas, right? Under a multi-party system, right, certain parties concede that they're not going to get votes for minor so they just give up, right? We think the fact of the matter is under a multi-party system, they concede they've already lost in certain demographics and certain minorities. Whereas in a bipartisan system, they can't give up these minorities because there's only two parties. There's very, very there's a lot of competition between these two groups, right? So instead of giving up to a minority group or a minority party, which has very little sway in the political spectrum, they're forced to change their policies to be more inclusive, right? They're forced to include more of these demographic groups, more of these minorities, so that they vote for the Republicans rather, no thank you, than voting for the Democrats, right? We think that's what they're forced to do. They're forced to facilitate these groups. We think in this scenario, hardliners are still gonna stay, right? Even if they are kind of mad, they're still gonna vote certain parties, not at this time, because they are hardline Republicans, they've always voted Republicans. But we think under a two-party system, these parties are able to adopt new policies that are more inclusive of different demographics and minority groups. We think this gives tangible benefits to those minority groups who, when they're represented by a minority party, can't get anything done. But when they're changed policies under a bigger party that can affect these policies and make them effectual, we think they can get things done. We give you the example of the Republicans in the United States, who are now trying to move to a more progressive society and are now trying to actually get more Latino votes within the states because they recognize the fact that they need to win over those Latino votes, right? We think that forced them to make more inclusive policies to, towards these Latinos in the states. We think this is good because views are represented better and these policies actually create change than having pop-up minority parties who really have no power at all and need influence in the political spectrum. My partner Alex is going to elaborate on that further. But first I'll go into this POI. Isn't it specifically hard to find someone to represent you if there's only two parties to choose between? Alright, thanks. Well, we think the fact of the matter is that both these parties are trying to buy these free votes, right? Because of the fact that these people are sitting on the fence, because of the fact that these people need representation, both of these parties need to have inclusive policies that represent these people in order to get their votes. And that's why they're going to be pressured into making inclusive policies so that they get these extra votes that might tip them over the edge, that might win them the election. But beyond that, what we tell you is that besides representation, this creates better social cohesion that actually advances the goals of that party, that actually advances the goals of a progressive society. Because of the fact that now these two parties are forced to be more inclusive, sure? not at this time, they have to gen generally gravitate towards the center in their policy, sure. right? They can't adopt hardline stances, they can't be to the like, very uh, polarized ends of the spectrum, because they have to move towards the center to be more inclusive 
of these demographics, Sorry. right? What this means is that the society can progress better because now you don't have random fringe movements that actually influence the rest of the political spectrum, right? Let me give you the example of the Tea Party. If that was a legitimate party in the political sphere, right, instead of being a small segment of the Republican it would actually distract and slow down the democratic process and make the society a whole lot less progressive. But because of the fact that the Republicans are trying to be more progressive and the Tea Party isn't like and the Tea Party doesn't have this kind of influence as it would if it was a tangible party, we think that actually there is more progressive society. Alright, second, we give you this idea about a more simplistic rationale. The premise here is that we create better, more informed voters and a better voting system. So first, let's ask the question, what do democracies typically suffer from? We think they typically suffer from a lack of interest, a lack of engagement, and a lack of voter turnout. But even if they don't, right, they suffer from a lack of informed voting, educated voting. We think these are chronic problems that harm democracies because they harm the legitimacy of the government principally, and they also harm the government's ability to represent the population, to represent the people. So then how can we create better and more informed, engaged voters? We think there's two actors. One, uneducated and disinterested voters, and two, educated and interested ones. We think for uneducated voters, when you have a bipartisan system, you simplify the choice for these voters, right? Because instead of choosing between hundreds of parties, and instead of being disengaged because there's so many choices, I don't want to invest my time in going through all of them and seeing which one I support, right? They actually are, they actually are more likely to buy into one of these parties because they're more likely to identify with them, right? Instead of choosing between these parties, you, there's less work involved in making this decision because you can make it a whole lot easier when you're choosing, right? This means that these voters are going to be more engaged, more incentivized to come out and vote because they don't have to go through multiple parties. But secondly, with educated voters, what we tell you is it allows them to contrast comparatively because you only have X amount of time to form your ideology and decide your vote, right? So if you have very limited time and you're not that engaged and you want to decide this vote, right? We think that you can have a more comparative contrast because of the fact there's only two parties, you can really analyze them on a deeper level and see which ones on a deeper level you can identify with better. But even if you don't agree with these parties, it incentivizes you to get involved because now you know that you can actually be part of a party that does create change rather than a minority party under their side of the house that won't have any influence in this spectrum. My partner Alex is again going to prove why the big parties always have the influence and why the big parties always take center stage. It's because we've stood on the side of, of, uh, of efficiency and better representation and it's because we want to create more progressive societies and better government we're so proud of. I thank the first speaker from side proposition, and now I'd like to welcome the first speaker from side opposition. is a representative democracy. We fundamentally believe that the world is no longer black and white, and there's many issues to voting that there were not before. That is why we today stand so proud to oppose today's motion. Today, team opposition brings you the push button that we will prove how our side of the house is more democratic because it's more representative, and two, how it is more effective in creating more happiness towards the entire population and making better or more viable solutions to the problems in today's democracy. We present you three arguments. One, the purpose of the democracy. Two, how politics are no longer black and white as they are on their side of the house. And three, my second speaker will come up here to tell you all about how we make sure that these politicians take a stance. So, before I get into my arguments, let's move, let us do a bit of the rebuttal that we took uh, today. So, essentially, we heard that uh, the entire first point was about how and um, how a multi-party system, the accountable, uh, how in a multi-party system, the minorities are ne never recognised, but that in a two-party system, these minorities are always recognized. Well, we'll tell you that we have three ultimate responses to that. So one, we simply think that that is untrue because we're saying that these 
uh, that these big parties, catch-all parties, have to give up the minority rights. Now, why is this? Because the majority of the population is not a minority, meaning the majority of the population does not necessarily agree with these minority rights. That is why these minorities need to go in in a representative government so their voice can be heard through an alternative party. Two, we didn't hear any, with the only analysis as to the interest we heard for these big catch-all parties to take in these minority folks into account is because these are votes. We already proved to you why the big catch all parties, the two political system parties, won't care about the small minority, but will want to catch, catch all parties. No, thank you. So, uh, thirdly, we had this entire idea of how the Republicans are trying to change the idea of the minorities and Latinos. We're saying that one, we don't essentially believe this is actually true, because they didn't give us any examples as to how this mechanism is going through right now. So ultimately, we just stand to disagree with this point. So, uh, then we have this entire thing of like how we can't have any hard hardliners, that means we'll have like very middle, um, and we have all the voters to be on the very middle line. But we're telling you that this is like one, I'm sure if we follow their line of analysis as to how we only care about catching all votes, and two, how this is also problematic for democracy because we're saying even hardliners should deserve to be representative. That is what they are under our side of the house. So, no, and then we had this entire idea of like how they suffer from lack of education because they don't want to waste any time going through their uh, going through their options in a representative government. What we ultimately tell you is that we create less educated voters, less voters on their side of the house because they just vote for their ideology, and also because they don't even care to vote on their side of the house. This is what I'm going to prove to you in my point. No, thank you. So let me now get into my two points today, which is one, the purpose of a democracy, and we said ultimately the purpose of a democracy is to represent an entire collection. Now, why doesn't any time? Why doesn't this? Uh, why doesn't the two political parties, such as things in the, in the USA, represent entire, its entire population? Well, we're saying that we have District A, where you get ten out of ten votes, and then you get one representative in Congress. Then we're saying that we have District B, where you get six out of ten votes. Let's say the Republicans get this, and the Demo Democrats got the other thing, and now they also get one representative. So even though the, the Democrats, in fact, got fourteen out of twenty votes, for, uh, ten in the first, four in the last, then they still only get one representative. We're saying that the Republicans, who essentially only had four out of 20 votes, still get the same power in the political house. We're saying this is not a representative government because it's essentially that the winner takes it all. We're saying that the 14 people are now not all uh, and now having the same equivalent power to six others, and we're saying that this is structurally unfair. Now, why is this problematic? Well, we're telling you it's problematic because now you'll start to feel as if your voice is not being heard. If you um, and how are we saying that that is extremely problematic for democracy? Now, why is this? Because if you feel like your voice isn't being heard, we say you are not necessarily going to go through the entire uh, issue with voting. Now, why is that problematic? Well, we're saying that in the US, in the status quo, what do you have? Uh, what is the voters turn out? Like around 50%, maybe a bit more. In Denmark, as opposed to that, where we have a representative government, people feel like their voice is being represented better. I'll get into this in my second argument. And that means that we have a voters turn out of over 80%. We're saying that it is essential for democracy to be legitimate to have this huge voters turnout because how else? Because how is it really a legitimate de uh, democracy when not all the vote, when not all the population are being taken into account? So. Why do we change all of this under our side of the house? Why are we creating a more effective government on our side of the house? And this is why I, uh, I get into my entire idea of politics no longer being black and white. And we're saying that, yes, in the old time, what we really had to worry about was econ. This two-party system might have been effective because what you really had to uh, vote for was whether you wanted a right-wing policy to econ or whether you wanted a left-wing policy. But we're telling you, in today's world, we have so many other arguments, so many other voting issues that we have to present. We we have to talk about refugees, we have to talk about the entire environment stance. No, thank you. We're saying that even though you have a specific stand as to how the financial policy should be run, this may not be the same as how you believe the environment should be run. So I'm telling you that Alberta, from my side, oh, no, thank you, of the bench, cares very much about the environment. She wants, she has wants a party that can represent her interest in, in, the, in the environment. We're saying, uh, now why does this only happen under the representative government? We're telling you that when we have this party then goes out and say, you know what, we fight so hard for environment, that's what we say is the most important thing, then that voice is bound to be heard, because some people will probably agree with Alberta that this is important. That means that this goes into the entire 
Now, this tells you, well, that you then have a voice in Congress. Now, why is this important? But well, we're telling you that on their side of the house, you will only have two parties to choose from, meaning that these two parties will have to be catch all parties. They'll have to take a stance on every single inch of voting. Firstly, we tell you that they don't really do that. Andreas will come up here and talk to you about that. But secondly, it also means that you'll simply have to go with the party you agree with the most on. Now, why is this problematic? Well, we're saying that in these parties, you, we're then going to have a large representation of differential on our ideas. So maybe we agree with left right ideologies overall, but left right uh, left wing ideology doesn't cover the issue of refugees. It doesn't cover the environment. We're saying that this is harmful when these kind of, when these kind of governments then have to make policies. No, thank you, because they will go in and they'll be like, okay, so one side of the house believes this, one side of the house believes this. We don't really know how we're going to make the most viable solutions. I'll take a POI now if you have any. Madam, at least in our world, these parties are more socially inclusive. In your world, no, no, parties no, are back I that don't have any. Yeah, problems. no, we completely disagree with that because we're saying this is not so. These are not more socially included. Why is this not? But we're saying that minority voices won't necessarily be had. We're saying that on our side of the house, you can find a party which you only agree with and everything, uh, which is more representative of you. We're saying that your voice you can direct directly to the government because you have a party which voice will be more like yours because it's not just going to be a catch-all party. We're saying you're going to have an environment, you're going to have a party which, as we're well, better, cares a lot about the environment. That means that when these people go into Congress, these people will be on environment is the most important thing to us, which essentially means that environment is going to be something that is fought harder. We're saying that this doesn't happen on their side of the house because there will be so many different variations of what you believe should happen to the environment. We're saying that ultimately we're creating more viable solutions for the population because more of the population's actual beliefs are taken into account. In a two-party state, you don't really know what the population is voting on. You don't really know if they're voting on more rest refugees and less refugees because the two parties are not so distinctive upon that part. You're only having these catch-all parties who go in and try to gain the most votes from that. So what have we essentially proven to you today? Well, we think that we've proven to you that we, this house takes the debate because we've proven, like, one, we are more representative, and two, we create better solutions for the entire population, which is more, which is more representative of the population. That's why we begged you to oppose today. Thank you. Speaker from side opposition. Now I'd like to welcome the second speaker from side propositions. Madam Speaker. We find it quite interesting that inside Denmark comes up and tells you that under our world, minority voices won't essentially be heard. What we tell you is on their side of the house today, there are so many political parties in their system that even if you are a minority and you vote for one of those parties that you think represents you, the reality is because there are so many parties, they have so little power in their government, they can't actually go get anything done and implement any of the policies that you want. And it's because we think that their side of the house today is very ineffective and we're so proud to stand on proposition today. What I'm going to do for you as a second speaker is three things. First off, I'm going to refute everything we heard on our side of the house today. Second, I'm going to re reconstruct the points my partner Sherman brought. And last, I'm going to go into my constructive address. We're going to be talking about making the systems more efficient. So the first point that they bring to you today was essentially that it is um, that you're not going to feel like your vote actually counts because of these parties are going to be more all-inclusive, right? What we say is under the status quo, or, or, or sorry, under their model, right, when you vote for a party, a lot of, there's so many parties, like in the United Kingdom, for example, where we have like seven or eight parties. The reality is if you vote for one of those parties, there's no there's no guarantee that your party is actually going to get power in the government. We saw in the United Kingdom, it just recently actually became where David Cameron received a majority, but for the longest time, it did have a minority government. The problem with this is under this minority government, nothing actually could get done because the problem is the party that had the minority government couldn't pass bills because all the other parties kept rejecting these bills. So even if you don't feel like you need your voice in, the two, in these two systems, at least you have input into a party that can have power, or you have input into the opposition party, which also has more significant party than say just a random party in the government who has like two or three seats. Next point that they bring to you was, well, essentially, we're going to actually have higher voting voter turnout when we have more parties, right? Because that happens in Denmark, therefore, it must happen everywhere else in the world. 
right? What we said to you is, let's take an example of Israel, for example. Israel has quite a few parties in their system, right? What we see is Israel has one of the lowest voter turnouts in the entire world, right? At the same time, we see the United States actually doesn't have that bad. They're about 60, 65% as of their last election. We think that under our model, if we have more of these parties, we're actually going to get people more interested, as my partner Sharon brought, because now we think because there are only two parties, it's easier to educate yourself on their stances. It's easier to figure out which party you support rather than seeing there are 10 parties up here, but I'm not really sure what their stances are. Go for it. But how is one single party possibly going to have uh, to? Uh, include all of the issue votings, which the, these that okay. just so, thank you. so we think that what actually is going to happen when you have these two-party political systems is we're going to force them to take a stance on all these issues, right? Because they're going to want to appeal to those voters who are on the fence. So when you have voters on the fence who are not sure who to vote for, we choose each party to take a stance to differentiate themselves from the other party. And because you only have two systems, they're going to want to take a unique stance. That's how we think that we're going to deal with each side of these. We think that we are giving voters both sides of the coin under our model. Okay, then the next thing they bring to you is that while there are many different issues, uh, which is kind of like the POI, so we need many different parties, right? We'd say that first off, we think that there are actually a lot of current parties that are based on, on economics, right? We think that that's how a lot of our government models work. We have left wing, we have right wing, right? So what we'd say to our models is even though that there can be more parties, we think they are still generally based off of economics, they take a lot of their stances based off of economics, right? We see in Canada, for example, that we have the Conservative Party, who is a more right wing party, but they're still very conservative on issues like the environment. We think that a lot of parties model it off of the economics. But even if they don't, for example, like a Green Party, for example, in Canada, right, which models it based on just saving the environment, we think they have a part where they simply don't have any power in the government because they don't have any votes because they actually don't address any of the other issues that are important in government, so nobody wants to vote for them anymore. Okay, uh, next point that they bring to you um, was that parties don't bring, oh, I already addressed that, never mind. Next point that they brought to you was that we're going to be creating more discussions between all these political parties, right? We think the problem with their model is we're now going to have so many political parties with so many different ideas, it's simply just going to cause confusion and nothing is going to be done because now we're going to have to compromise between like 10 different parties instead of two different parties. No, thank you. So we think the problem is that ultimately is going to lead where certain parties aren't going to get their opinions for anyways because ultimately the country, the, these, uh, sorry, parties that have the government are going to want to take only in the uh, input of the other powerful parties who they think actually might be helpful. They're not going to want to take in some random parties or someone who only have like five or ten seats because they don't value that they have enough power in the system. But we think at least under our model, we're going to have two parties who are directly debating this issue who are going to eventually come to a compromise or want to come to a compromise. But even if we don't, we have one party who's in government, who has a majority, who can at least put something through and make actually legislation happen. Whereas under their model, you have so many parties and you have a minority government to the fact where you can't actually push anything through, nothing gets done. All right, onto some reconstruction. So the first point that my partner Sharon brought to you was that essentially we're going to be fostering some more cohesive society, right? We think that dem democracies exist for the people under two parties. We're going to have, we're going to make them vote for one of them. We think that this is ultimately going to be more inclusive because these parties now are going to be forced to take up stances, right? First response to this, no thank you, was that, well, the majority of the population doesn't necessarily have these ideologies, right? We think that's why it's going to force these two parties actually to expand what they believe in, to expand their positions on different things because ultimately they're going to want to find in. We think in the example of the Republican Party that my partner brought to you was the fact that they're trying to actually get in more Hispanic voters. They actually had a conference for the Republicans simply on how to get more Hispanic voters because they realized that they're important to actually win the election. So we think this is going to create more collective policies that are going to want to take into account actually more people. But on top of that, when they take into more people, they're actually their voices are going to be part of a party that has power that can actually do something on those rather than a party that has no power on their side of the house. But the next, Sharon brings this idea of a cohesive society. Sure. Their only response was, well, hard lines need to be represented too. We think the hard lines can be represented in the parties that already exist. We think you can create uh, multiple stances on, on certain issues, right? You can be more conservative economically, or you can be more liberal um, in terms of economics. All right, now to some constructive. We're going to talk about efficiency through this point. Oh, thank you. Uh, we're going to just prove essentially how ours is going to be a much more efficient system, actually get something done compared to their system. So what's the status quo with multiple party uh, political systems right now? Well, many of them are very inefficient, very ineffective. Why is this? Well, we think that there are a ton of political parties in the system. If you look at India, for example, which has hundreds of political parties in their system, which is one of the reasons that their government struggles with actually being able to get anything done. So we think that what is the problem with this? Well, we think that the problem is that there are simply so many parties, it's too hard to represent every single person, right? So under that, what's the problem with having so many political parties? Parties. We think that the problem is, essentially, whenever one party proposes a bill, it's just going to be shot down by the other parties for two reasons. 
First off, either they don't believe in what that party is putting through, but second off, they simply just want to block it because they don't want to show support for that party, or they don't want to show that that party has any credibility. Because when it comes to voting, if you voted with that party, it shows that you somewhat support what that party's doing. It also shows that that party can get things done, right? So even under that scenario, these parties don't want that. They ultimately want to win themselves. It's incentive for them to block these bills. So the problem with that is now simply nothing is going to get done because you can't push anything through. But why is the two-party political system change that? Well, you think under our model, someone is always going to get a majority. Someone's always going to win the election. They're going to have power to push these bills through. Now, why is it a good thing? Well, we think that now you can make decisions very quickly. You can say, like, look, I want economic reform here. We're going to go do it. Right? We think that in the 2008 economic crisis in Canada, for example, one of the reasons the government wasn't as efficient and quick in dealing with the situation was because we had a government that wasn't a majority. So every time the party of the conservatives tried to push through a bill, all the other parties blocked it. So then they couldn't actually respond to the situation. The difference is under ours, we actually want to have a party that is able to respond to these very quickly. But at the same time, we think that they're still going to have to keep their credibility. They're still going to have to ensure that bills they're putting through are good because they're still subjected to debates in things like Parliament or the or the Senate, right? So we're, we're going to be checked with that. But also we think that they are going to face media scrutinization, right? We think they simply just can't pull off whatever bill they want. They actually have to do something that's in the But third off, we think we have elections. So even if they do put through a bad bill, we now have a checks and balances system where if we don't like them, we can take them out and put in the other party. But we think that ultimately it's because our side of the house is going to be much more efficient in dealing with issues, deal with them very, very quick, whereas their side just causes more chaos and confusion. We're so proud to stand on propositions today. <laughs>
Firstly, we already told you that we have less cooperation within the parties, right? Because we already told you that made up of different ideals, that they're going not they're not going to agree on anything. Secondly, we think that more inclusive politics within a party isn't necessarily a good thing. We think that we should have like we should have a party that I can specifically identify with, not like one that is composed of a lot of different ideals, right? We think, think that firstly that's ineffective, and secondly that's going to work in the democracy, right? Furthermore, they told us in their, they told us that's going to lead to more social cohesion, right? Firstly, we already told you that no, because there's going to be like conflict within the part. There's going to be conflicts within the party due to different ideas. But secondly, we say it's hard to cooperate for these two uh, parties, right? Because ideologically, they're like so different, right? So even if those two uh, parties had to cooperate, we think it's very hard for them to do it in the first place, right? Because they're ideologically different, right? Then they told us as a response, well, we can have multiple stances within a party, but we think it's problematic that if a party in the first place has to have multiple stances within a case, like on a certain case, right? We don't even think that's going to be true in the first place. We don't think the Republicans are going to go out and say, you know what, we're going to raise taxes. On the other hand, no, we're going to lower the taxes, right? They can't have like several stances on different topics, right? On the same topics, nothing. Furthermore, they talked about how like we're going to like have more and more voters, right? And they talked about like like those who are uneducated, uh, uneducated, right? And that was similar to dying things. Firstly, that's exactly the problem, right? Because politics is not black and white. We simplify politics. Why is that bad? Because now when I go out and vote on a different, on a certain like bill or something, I don't necessarily know what it contains because they're going to be like these broad ideas, right? And they can't really take a stance in the first place. So that's why you don't, we don't have any specific politics. This is what my third argument is about. But furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, we think that they're talking about like these educated people. They only have an X amount of time to deal with these 10 parties. I'm sorry if I'm wrong, but I don't think it's that hard necessarily to like look at these 10 parties. What do I agree with? Because there's so much exposure in the social media when you watch TV, when you're with, with your friends, with your, with, with your family, right? You're constantly being exposed to these different parties and how they're impacting your daily life, right? It's not like you're going home for homework and looking at what do I necessarily agree with, right? You're going to be exposed to it every day and you're kind of forced to take a stance also because your friends are asking you about it every day. So we think that firstly, it's bad simplifying politics, and secondly, that we go, that, that um, it's not that hard to like make that decision, right? But furthermore, we they talked about like it's easier to figure out. We essentially don't think that people are that dumb, right? We think that's a narrow conception of the individual human being, right? So ladies and gentlemen, they brought up this third point about um, that there are too many parties and you can't identify with them all, right? And like the other person will just like block the um, bills and stuff. Firstly, we tell you that it's going to be even worse under their model, right? Because like, if you have two ideological different parties, like the one is not going to say, okay, I'll just agree on your ideology, right? They're going to be so different in the first place. Before I move on, yes? The reason this works is because when that party has a majority, they're able to push their bill through without hundreds of other parties pointing right, them right, down right. and opposing them. Ladies and gentlemen, we think it's problematic that they think that necessarily that is these bills that they are pushing through are going to be good bills, right? If we think that under our model, they're going to create a majority in which is being like made up of like different parties that did agree on that specific bill. We think that's the society we want, right? Furthermore, <coughs> furthermore, we get to this we get to this first argument uh, about the wouldn't takes at all. That's not democratic at all. Clara already gave an example of District A and B and how it's like not democratic at all and what are the harms of it. Firstly, she told her that it's going to distance the people from the government in the first place, but secondly, also it's going to decrease like the voting um, voting range, uh, voting like percentage, right? Because like I can't because there are less parties to identify with, right? I don't necessarily only identify with like one of the two parties. That means when I go out of vote, I don't necessarily want to vote on one of those two. That decreases like the democracy as a whole. We think that's bad. They didn't really respond to that. This, our second point was like there's going to be conflicts within the party. Now they said it was confusing like with all of these parties. We essentially think that's an our conception of an individual human being already dealt with that. But ladies and gentlemen, we think that like we think that um this going only to create conflicts within the party because of different ideals I already explained that. Let's move on to my third and final argument, the two party political system. How it's going to create more general politics and why it's bad. Firstly, our thesis is there's going to 
to create like less specific policies, right? Which is less effective system. Why is it less specific? Clara already told you in your second in her second argument, there's going to be conflicts within the different parties because of the different ideologies, right? That means that they can't really take a stance because then they are uh, offending like one group of their supporters, right? So they have to be more general to be like catch them all, right? But ladies and gentlemen, we think this is bad because then they can't promise any specific things, but all of their politics are going to be very general, right? So we think that this has two harms, right? Firstly, we think it's hard, and hard even to like implement a bill when you're being so general, right? You can't limit, like implement general bills, but they need to be more specific. But secondly, even if you're going to like implement them, it's not going to be beneficial to the population because look, there is not representative. But thirdly, it's going to change people's mindsets of politics from being very general. Why is this bad? It's, big, it's bad because within these bills, they can put everything in there, generalize the uh, generalize the bill, and people don't vote on it. So ladies and gentlemen, stand with opposition today. Thank you. I thank the second speaker from side opposition. I'd like to welcome the last speaker, last constructive speaker from side opposition. Madam Speaker, side proposition never said that bipartisan, bipartisan like political system is perfect. But what we do stand on on our side of the house today is that's more representative and it's more efficient and more effective than their side of the house, which is more than like two parties, right? So what am I going to be really talking about? Firstly, I'm going to be asking which system provides better representation. Secondly, which is more efficient. So firstly, which system provides better representation, right? What did they tell you? They essentially told you, right, that the purpose of democracy is to represent the entire like population. And under our model, there's going to be like people not represented. Right? We say, okay, yes, that's true, but under their model, it's going to be worse. Because in their model, right, if there's, let's say, even three parties and ten people in a specific area, when it's 4 3 3 split, you're going to find one representative representing like the the minority, right, the 40%, that seems to be like a majority because there's the most amount of votes, but there's going to be 60% in that area who aren't represented at all. So we say, no, thank you. we say that their model is in fact even worse in terms of like representation, because when you do have like more than one party, it's very, very hard for any party to reach actual like over 50% majority. So we think that in fact, under our model, at least you will have the majority of the population being represented by a party instead of like you know just having a 40 30 30 split and then having the minority which happens to be a slightly larger minority being represented but still minority nonetheless right so we think that's something that they completely fail to actually prove next they talk about this idea that you know actually well it doesn't include all the issues right so for example someone on that side of the house said they really care about like environment we say okay yes that's true one party maybe in the, their system agrees with like just environment but we think that when you vote, you only have one vote. So you have to give that vote to like, you know, a party which deals with more than just one issue, right? We think that people generally care about more than just one issue. But people don't just care about the environment. We think there's like environment, there's like, like international relations. We think there's economics. We think there's many facets of like politics. So you can't just simply give your vote to say, okay, I like this group because I like their environmental policies. I'm going to give a vote to them. And I like them for their economic policies. So I'm going to give a vote to them. You can't do that. You only have one vote. So we think that essentially what you're going to have to do is prioritize and choose only one thing that you really want instead of being able to like, you know, talk to your representative and say, no, no, here's all the things that I really want. And, you know, those because you have to choose a specific part, right? No, thank you. And then they say, well, um, minority is going to be like ignored in this case. We say no because of the fact that these groups, like the two groups, have to get these people, right? Sure. They have to get these votes, no thank you, because of the fact that if they don't get it, the other party will, and if the other party gets them, then they're going to lose on that path, right? Because so, if they don't get it, the other party gets it, whereas in their system, if they don't get it, another third party, a smaller party, might get them, so it doesn't really matter anyways whether or not that minority is like considered by the party at all. So we think that's why we think that minorities don't be cared for more on our side. 
What did we tell you? We told you, you know, majority seats will always go to a party, right? We see that the majority party is then representative of the majority of the population, right? As opposed to a majority party, which, you know, really is a majority. It's simply like a larger minority group, right? We think that when we are side of the house, even a very, very close election, where it's 51 and 49 split, the 51% still going to be better represented. Whereas in their case, even a very, very good split would be like 40, 30, 30, which means that, you know, still 60 Sixty percent would not be like un not represented, right? So we say that actually our our side better represents people. But we say further that parties, right? They have like multiple ideologies within a certain party. That's something that they said, and they say, okay, this is going to stop everything. We say no because then you have to compromise within your own party, right? You can't just say, okay, we're going to go completely right wing or completely left wing, like they can't do under their model because they can't have extremist groups, right? But what we say is that now you have to like compromise within your own group, right? You can't just simply reject like people who's in your party's opinions. You have to kind of take them into consideration, right? But when you have multiple parties, you can. Say we say, okay, well, that's the opinion of another party, so we're going to reject it outright. We don't need to compromise, right? So we think that essentially, this our side of the house leads to more compromises within the government. We think that's good because that works towards the common good of the people, right? And then they talk. So we think that you know that falls on our side of the house. And then there's like this idea that well, you know. When we think that there's like when it's single party, which is like a large, large, you know, minority, means that it's much more powerful than like if a couple of small groups actually object, right? We think that when you have 40% of the population saying no, we don't want this, it's much more powerful than like if a 20% group and a 10% group stands up and says no, because then we think that like. It really doesn't work under that model, right? Because of the fact that there's more people under like a two-party system, even in the minority party, right? And lastly, we told you this idea, like informed decisions, right? So what they they these we what we essentially tell you is that because of the fact that most people will increase or decrease the time they spend on politics just because there's more party, parties popping up. So we say that when you have X, a fixed amount of time, when you split that among two different parties, you're going to be able to know them much better than if there's like 10 parties, right? So if, if like it's simple math because X over two just simply means it's more than X over 10. So we think that they're going to be able to like know better. Their simple response is really just, well, there is enough of exposure. We think that yes, maybe that's true for their side of the house. Maybe it's true, sorry. For these specific like people, right? We think that they're very involved in politics. That's great, but we say that the majority of the, like population isn't that involved, right? Not every single one of their friends is asking them, well, which party are you going to vote on? We don't think that's a correct characterization of the majority of the population. We think most of them are like more or less apathetic. They choose whoever their ideology agrees on. We think that's good because you know, like. Parties create like bills based upon ideologies, right? So we think that's actually good. And they say, well, they're not that dumb. We say, okay, it's just generally a comparatively more time spent on each party. So we know each party better, therefore it's a better, like more informed decision, right? So next Sorry, go ahead. You can go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. So, <laughs> so if, if an individual actually votes wants to vote on like more than one issue, right? There's only two parties to vote between. How can you ensure the individual agrees upon everything and what of, on one of the parties uh, like get program? Okay, so when under your model, right, essentially what you said was that okay, well there's going to be parties really, really for like environmental policies, so therefore that's the one you're going to vote for. Well what we tell you is that well that one isn't going to represent all of your views either. We don't think any party can like perfectly represent all of your views. You only have one vote, so we think that it goes to the party which like best represents. You. We think that when it's two party system, it means that, that those parties will have to compromise and like take in the majority of your opinions, right? They and then so we talk about like this idea of like which is more efficient, right? All they really told you about is all oh, our side of the house is going to have general policies. We say, okay, A, they're not just going to, they're not going to be general, they're going to be compromised, yes, but they're not going to be like just general policies, right? And also, if their side of the house says it's very, very specific, our house comes with very, very specific policies, then why is it that multiple groups would all agree on it? Because if it's very, very specific, it's only really going to represent like the groups, like the interests of one specific group, and that's going to be a minority group under their model, why is it going to be passed? We don't see that connection, right? And then so what did we tell you? We tell you there's going to be a majority of people 
that's actually going to be able to like vote and pass bills. And we say, okay, they say, oh well, it's not going to be good. We say they're still accountable under like public scrutiny, under like media scrutiny. They're still going to be held accountable for any of their actions. It's not just going to be like, okay, they're no longer going to be held accountable. We think that's completely like untrue. And for those reasons, we're so proud to propose. Thank you. Are there any third speakers from side proposition? I'd like to welcome the third speaker from side opposition. Madam Speaker, what Team Proposition has managed to prove to you today was that there will be a higher quantity of resolutions under their world. There will be a higher quantity of the bills that will be passed. What we at Side Opposition stand for is a higher quality of bills. Of a, a higher quality meaning that the bills will be more effective, better in the long term for the larger amount of the population, which we believe that we will have under a multi-party system, which is why I'm so proud to oppose in today's speech. So before, um, like, actually just going straight into the two clashes that I have identified uh, in today's debate, which is, a, is firstly, who uh, has the better representation, like what is, um, who has the better democracy, and secondly, who has the most effective system. So firstly, to democracy. So they firstly brought to us this part, this argument about like the representation um, and social representation and social, social cohesion. So they said to us that because there's a social, there, there, there's a two-party system, these these parties will want to like catch everyone. They will want to get the votes of everyone, also the minorities, for the young thank you. For that reason, they will also want want to like, um, they will also want to get the votes of the minorities, and for that reason, also like benefit the minorities. Firstly, we see that under the status quo, this is not the case. We don't see that the huge, like that the Republicans are to a large degree fighting for a minority rights. This is simply not the case. Secondly, we say that a minority, that like the a minority, the minorities are not going to feel very represented by a, by, by like um, a lot of white guys in the ties and suits that like who mostly care about economy and tax rate and tax um, releases or like and taxes. We don't believe that this is like we don't believe that this stands at all. We don't believe that they will feel represent, represented, which we believe is very um, crucial in order and uh, very crucial for democracy. Secondly, um, they brought to you uh, like secondly we argued uh, for the fact that like. Um, <clears throat> Oh, secondly, we say that because, uh, like, because these parties become catch-all parties, you will now have to vote for a party like where you uh, where you disagree with like seventy percent of what the country of what the, what this party stands for. Perhaps there's like thirty percent of that party fighting for what you believe in, which could be, for instance, like minority rights, which could be, as I believe strongly, and as Clara also pointed out, um, like. Um, um, environment. This could be like 30% of what the party actually stands for, but for but the rest 70%, like they is not something that you agree with. We think that it's very like unlikely that you will actually find a party with if there's only two choices where you will feel like all your beliefs are being represented. No, thank you. When there are several parties to choose from, you are way more likely to find a party that actually where you actually believe that you are being represented, where you actually believe that what you believe in is being uh, fought, fought for. Secondly, we believe that even though the small parties representing the, the minorities might not have a lot of power, might not be the, the, the parties in government, might not be the parties who have like the majority of the votes or the majority of uh, the seats in parliament, and therefore not being able to pass resolutions alone, we believe that it's, it's important that these parties exist because these are the one, ones creating uh, awareness about the problems of, for instance, minorities or, or for instance um, environment we, we believe that just the fact that they are there just the fact that they have seats in the parliament makes sure that they can actually create awareness about the problem and actually force the, uh, the, the parties who actually have the government 
power, who actually have the majority of the votes, the majority of the seats in parliament, can actually force them to deal with this problem and also make sure that there's awareness within society, within the population of uh, like um, of these problems. And for that reason, also force the ones in power to actually address these issues. We believe that that is very important. Um, but you would disagree. We go now on your side of the house. It's very unlikely to be you'll still find a political party that represents every single view that you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. an exclusive part of all of Okay, so yes, it's hard to find a party where you're represented 100%. This is very unlikely because, it, yes, everyone has like very specific, very different like uh, preferences. But we believe that it's way more likely that you will find someone who's closer to what you believe in if, if, when there's like 10 options instead of two options. That is essentially just what we believe in on our side of the, side of the house. Um, lastly, we brought to you a point in Andreas' speech about how catch all parties are not focusing on like specific issues, are not going to be like uh, specific um, because they're afraid of losing members. That leads them to be like very, uh, very not substantial. And for that reason, um, because they're afraid of losing members, it doesn't become about, about the politics. It, it becomes about getting members instead or get, getting uh, voters instead of uh, actually ad addressing the things that th this party believes in. And we believe for that reason, this is like very harmful um, uh, to the to how politics is addressed under this under uh, the status quo. So moving on to the second point of clash about effectiveness. So firstly, we heard. Um, so the first thing I'm going to address is, the pro is like mainly what they talked about in the third argument about how it's hard for like uh, for a lot of different uh, for for a lot of different. Uh, parties to cooperate and uh, make compromises and for that reason that it, it makes it ineffective because they can't pass resolutions and bills will not be passed. So essentially this is also the point that I talked about in my intro that we believe that this leads to a higher higher quantity of resolutions. We believe that it's actually it's actually beneficial that we have a lot of conversation, that we have a lot of negotiation before passing a bill. Also that we have a lot of negotiation between a lot of different parties with a lot of different opinions because all these parties, because all these parties represent very different opinions and very different se different segments of society. And because they represent all these different segments, then that means that all like um that all um interest within society will be addressed when discussing and when uh, like negotiating about resolution, meaning that in the long term, this will actually lead to a more, uh, to a higher quality of re resolutions. And in the long term, a, a res resolution that will actually benefit more people, a larger part of this population, um, a larger part of the population, like in a longer period of time, because all uh, interests within society was being addressed and because it was a longer process of negotiation compared to when it's just one party having power, being able to pass whatever they believe in the most, um, believe is like most important. Um, so also they, we, they talked about in their second point, they, like how people will now have an easier time understanding politics because there are only these two parties um, and they don't have to like uh, look into like seven, 10 different parties and that would be easier. We say that essentially this is not true. We say that it's true, yes, that there are some people who have a hard time understanding politics, but having two parties that have like a thousand different opinions within one party is way harder to understand for you than to have like 10 different parties with 10 different opinions. It's hard to figure out what does the Democrat stand for and what does the Republican stand for because it is so like because there are so many variations within these two parties. We believe that, believe that, that is way harder to understand. Secondly, we say that we will not, this will not lead to people being more like um, wanting to vote more. That is why we say that in, under the status quo, we have like 86% uh, uh, election participation in Denmark and 50% in the US because people don't feel like they're represented. Because they're not represented, they don't want to vote. So we don't believe that the point stands that, you're, that because you understand it better, you will be more likely to vote. Secondly, they brought to you a point about India and because like because they have like a hundred parties, then suddenly like there will be no bills passed because it's very ineffective. We say that this is a very exaggerated exaggerated example. It, it is this is like very uh, uncommon that, uh, that to have like a hundred different parties. And uh, India is a very unique example. They have like a lot of other problems resulting in their political system being um, being ineffective and being insecure. So we don't believe that this point uh, and this that this example stands at all. In our first and second point, we address to you the problems about how we're not being represented, about how we're not, how this leads to a better negotiation, meaning a higher quality of bills. And for all these reasons, I'm so proud to oppose today's debate. And then the third speaker from side opposition, and I want to welcome the reply speaker from side opposition to summarize their team's case.
After a long debate, both teams are still wearing red, but it doesn't mean that we have come to a compromise yet. And it's the same thing within the party in the two political, two political system, because there are so many different ideals within that system. Because if I want to go into, the, into office, right, I have to choose the party that is closest to my belief. But we don't only think there's two beliefs in today's world, and we think there are actually seven. There might be 10, there might be 20, and we think that having 10 parties, people can identify with those parties, right? And when you go into office, right, you're going to have more cooperation within that party because you can identify more with it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have two questions for this reply. Firstly, who upholds democracy better? And secondly, who creates a more effective bill in democracy, right? Firstly, who, up who upholds democracy better? Now, I told you that it's going to be more representative because it gives minority a bigger say. Now, firstly, we've told you throughout the benches that they're not going to have a bigger say. When we catch all parties, such as, like, let's say, Republicans or Demar uh, the Democrats, right, we don't think that it can take all opinions into account. Exactly because it's made up of so many ideologies, right? They can't really like take all into account. And exactly because they're minorities, they don't have a big say in that party in the first place. But let's look at our model. In our model, these minorities, they actually have a say. Because now they have their own party fighting for exactly their cause. That's not happening on their model. By having a party fighting for their cause, right? We think that they actually have a say when they have to make up a majority. They might exactly be the party that goes from having the minority for a vote to a majority, right? We think that in that way, they're feeling like uh, that way they're having a bigger say. But let's say even if they aren't having a bigger say, we think just the mere fact that they're going to feel more included in the society and in the government, right? We think that's good because even if they're just voting for the Republicans, but they aren't really making any bills for them, they're not feeling included, right? They never actually dealt with that point. Now let's look at their type of democracy versus ours. They are advocating for society in which um, the Democrats might have like 14 out of like 20 votes, but still the Dem Democrats and Republicans only like have one seat in Parliament each, even though the Democrats have 14 out of 20. Now, Clara told you explicitly why this is not democratic, right? And why it's not being, um, and why this is bad, right? They, they told us that uh, that um, our model, like, isn't really that, that different, isn't really like doing anything different. But uh, we tell you today that it's made up of the exact percentage that like uh, voted on a party. So if eight percent of the population voted on, let's say, um, Democrats, Democrats. Democrats, right? We think that actually they're having 8% of their seats in parliament, right? And they, that's not happening on their model. They might even only have two or none. So ladies and gentlemen, we think that we're upholding society better. Secondly, who creates more effective bills? They told you that we have to vote in a party which represents all of your beliefs because nobody is a single issue voter. We think, we think that firstly, that's just fundamentally untrue. There are a lot of like single issue voters, right? But secondly, we think it's very hard to have like a party that's going to represent all of your beliefs, especially when there are only two. So we don't really think that stands, and we think that leads to like less uh, democracy because people can't really identify with those two, um, those two parties in the first place. Then they told you that people feel more included. I, we've already explained to you why they don't feel more included, because they don't have a say in these two party systems, but they have a more say like, in, if they have their own party. Well, ladies and gentlemen, they told us like, we will have like, informed voters then. Firstly, we don't essentially think that people are dumb. We, don't, we actually think that people can make their choice out of having 10 parties, right? We think that this is also due to exposure, like through social media, TV, friends that are asking them to family, right? We don't think people are dumb. But secondly, we think that it's better on the oral, right? That you're going to be like, like more informed because now you have like specific politics for the specific party. And on the their model, it's only going to be general, which I explained in my third argument. Now, ladies and gentlemen, today you have to give a vote for democracy. You have to give a vote for the people. Give a vote for opposition. Thank you. <laughs>
I'll speak up and start our position. I'd like to welcome the last speaker of today's debate. It is true that we're all wearing red, but if I suddenly change my tie to blue, it doesn't change the fact that we still haven't reached a consensus, we still haven't reached a conclusion. And it's because, at least on our world, when we're all wearing red and eventually make a conclusion, we can assert that conclusion on the society and make it work, rather than in a world where we're all wearing blue, they're all wearing red, and it doesn't work. We're so proud to still be standing on proposition today. What I'm going to do for you as a reply speaker is look at this debate to see which, which side promoted a better government that actually advanced society, whether it was through better representation or better efficacy. The biggest argument we hear coming out of opposition today is that people are better represented when they can vote for like minority parties, right? People are better represented, their views are better represented there, right? We have a few responses. First off, we, all, we actually proved to you, through all of our analysis, that these parties are inclined to be more socially inclusive now, right? Because they have to get all these minority voters. They just said, well, minority voters are a really small demographic, parties aren't going to care. But when you have a lot of different minorities to actually go over, the party will have to care because it is incentivized to care about all those minorities to buy up their votes, right? But second, what they tell you is that people are going to, um, but second, what they tell you is that what we tell you is that people who vote for specifically, even under their system, and vote for a minority party who has a very specific view, those bills still aren't going to get passed. Because the fact that it's a specific view doesn't change, right? That party's influence is very limited because of the specificity of its view. But then they never tell you why these parties actually work. And it's because of that that their point falls. Because they just asserted that minority parties do work, they do get things done. But we've actually shown you why they don't. They don't get things done because when you have a limited number of people voting for it, it doesn't actually pass things in the House. Their minority views aren't represented. Instead, all they can do is point fingers at the government and say you can't do that and limit social progress. That's what we showed you down the bench. But third, we tell you that even if these parties do, like, even if they do get the vote, right? Even if they do feel better represented somehow through these parties, these parties fundamentally can't get done because the government can't progress, right? Because they don't have equal power as the ruling party who's always going to shut them down and always going to shut down their minority views. Essentially what this debate came down to today is whether the change and influence of minorities happens within parties that can actually create change or whether this change happens within a house that doesn't create change because it's really complicated and the views are objective. What we tell you to this point is change works better when you facilitate it within a party. When you force these parties to be more socially inclusive and care about minority rights, right? Because of the fact that you have two powerful parties under like a Canadian system, such as the Conservative and the Liberals, the minority views of the Bloc Quebecois are never actually represented because these parties kind of reject those minorities, they don't really care about their votes. But in a bipartisan system, you force these two big parties to care about minority votes because they have to buy them, right? But beyond that, though, we tell you that this creates more social cohesion. All they really tell you in response is that general politics isn't good. First off, these aren't general politics. They're ethical politics. They're actually more centrist and more moderate politics rather than random specific bills that never get passed because they don't have support in the House. But beyond that, what we tell you is that these specific policies, like the harms are not exclusive to them, right? Because we showed you down the bench that if your minority isn't going to succeed in, in, in our system, right? It isn't going to succeed in a house when there's a lot more minority parties who actually beat it down, right? We told you that their harms of why these minority parties can represent these people's views, they actually can't. They just asserted that they never proved it to you. But what did we tell you? Again, we tell you that like, there's more social cohesion, right? Under their world, places like Israel still prosper because, like, because the government there, Benjamin Netanyahu, has a heavy dislike against him, and it is a political failure because not everyone's views are represented. They can get nothing done as a society. We told you change is better facilitated when you incentivize people to care and when you incentivize the parties to care about minorities rather than just reject minority views and then beat them down in the house. It's because we stood on the side of democracy and it's because we stood on the side of a more progressive society. We're so proud of you for both.